Blessed be your name. We love you, Jesus. With all of our hearts, your word, your Lord. You're a great God. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. He's a worthy God. He's worthy to be praised. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to ask Janet Andrews to come up right now. We're going to have a prayer. We're going to pray over our Vacation Bible School that's coming up this July, July the 17th through the 21st. And then the next day is Family Fun Day to conclude Vacation Bible School. Every week, we're going to be praying. Different ones of you have a prayer. And then you have a prayer that you received when you came in the church. So come on up. Sister Carol, thank you. Good morning. I am not Janet Andrews. I am Carol Aquino. And I hope everyone this morning had an opportunity to get our prayer for Vacation Bible School. One of the things that I have always believed in is the L relationship of God. From God to me. Very simple, right? It's part of that evangelistic tool. And Vacation Bible School gives us an opportunity to express the L relationship of God. And Tiger Covenant has it set up so that our expression to the community, it expands not just to children, but also to adults. But for right now, um, our Vacation Bible School gives you the opportunity to reach out to the parents in the community, the parents that we have here in the church. We never know who God is going to bring. And it's an awesome time. Last night, we had our kickoff for our capital fundraiser. Had an awesome time. Sandra, you did good, girl. You did good. Yes, yes. Yes, she did. She did. It was fun. It was an awesome time. This morning, I'd like to ask you to join me in prayer. And for some, um, had a few questions. You want to keep our prayer notification and pray it throughout the week as God leads you to. So can I have everyone who has one of these notifications to stand, please? <laughs> yes. Pastor has said that this is an all out church community outreach that we're, uh, VBS it does. And so if you would join me, pray for our VBS. Dear God, thank you for going before us as we prepare for vacation by Bible school. Help us meet any need of supplies, decorations, and volunteers we may have. Provide the opportunity for families far and wide to attend VBS. Thank you for the opportunity to pour into the lives of these kids in deep and meaningful ways. We pray that above all else, you are glorified in our VBS. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. You may be seated. We're going to dismiss our children for Children's Church. Let's give our children a hand clap as they go. Bless the children. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion. This is a holy moment when we remember the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, his death. Come unto me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
I am the bread of life, Jesus is speaking. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our hearts, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Silent prayer before God. The scripture tells us to examine ourselves. If there's any sins committed, ask God to forgive you. Anything that needs to be made right with another brother or sister, even do it now before you take communion or don't take. This is a holy moment. This table of the Lord is open for all who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Prepare yourselves. Let's have silent prayer. Amen. So Jesus was with his disciples. He took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And after he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me when you eat. Do it in remembrance of me. When you have the meal, remember that Jesus' body was broken for you and I. And then Jesus took the cup among them. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. If you have your cups that you received when you came into service, open them up now. There's a top wafer in the top part. The bottom part is the juice. Let's eat together the body of our Lord. And now the cup. Jesus said, this cup is my blood shed for you. Shall we drink together? Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as your living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Give us now your peace and grant us strength and courage through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Well, not yet. Not yet. We have something exciting to do. Not yet. We had two new member classes last Sunday and the Sunday before last. And we went through the scriptures and we went through a little booklet. And so we have five new people that have decided that they want to become members of Tiger Covenant Church. Give them a hand clap. So we're going to ask Mindy and Chris and Jackie and Arthur and Angie to please come forward. We're going to ask our church council to please come forward. Give them another hand clap as they come forward. (laughs) 
So we went through a lot of scriptures and we asked a lot of questions. And so I'll be asking you a few questions in a minute. But in the meantime, here's the microphone. Give us your name. And if you want, you can say a few words, but mainly your name. It's not on. Hello, hello. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I am Angie Parker. Um, I've been a member actually for many years, probably a good 10, 12 years, but I stepped away for a few, so I'm just coming back. <laughs> good morning. I'm Arthur Johnson. I've only been here for two months. Uh, Angie brought me here. I was welcome. Uh, it's been a blessing to be here. I jumped right in with Food Pantry. I love volunteering. Anything you need, I'm here. It's a blessing to be here. Hi, I'm Mindy Johnson, and I think we've been coming since about November, and we are really happy to be here, so thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Chris Johnson, uh, Mindy's husband, and uh, we've been, we've visited a lot of different churches, I think, in our, uh, in our time together, our 35 years together. Um, have never spent as much time here enjoying this church with all of you, and, and we, we feel so loved being here. Um, so thanks for having us. We really love it here. I'm Jackie Guthrie, and I'm very happy to be here. This is a church that... Um, I don't know, I laugh and I cry all the time here, so it's wonderful how the Lord works. Okay, now I want to have something to give you. I want you to open up one of them and read it. Read what it says. You need a microphone? This certifies that the above name has publicly confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and has been received into full fellowship of the Tiger Covenant Church on June 4th, 2023. Amen. Amen. All right. So I have, uh, I have four questions to ask all of you new members. And if you uh, respond in the affirmative, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and promise to follow him as Lord? You have made public profession of your faith and have been baptized. Do you accept the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, as the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct? Do you intend to live among God's faithful people, to hear God's Word and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, and to strive for justice and peace over the whole earth? Do you also promise to support the ministries of this church, including the conference and denomination to which we belong? Father God, I ask that you bless these people, these your servants that are here this morning. May they feel the presence of your love and grace, and as they give and impart to us, may we give and impart to them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, congregation, you stand. I have a question for you. Do you, Tiger Covenant members and friends, promise to support them, love them, and serve together with them to do the gospel of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. Give them another hand clap. <laughs> Give them the right hand of fellowship. Love you, Jackie. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Chris. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Church Council, give them the right hand of fellowship. You may be seated at the end of service. Make sure you go up to these five people. Please, please, please. Go up to these five people. Greet them at the church. And say, welcome to Tiger Covenant Church. You online, if you want to chat them up, say, welcome to Tiger Covenant Church. And I'll tell them that you said online, welcome to Tiger Covenant Church, okay? I'm so excited to present a talk to you this morning on the subject, the Great Commission. It's taken out of Matthew 28, 
Uh, we're becoming like some churches that are very liturgical. We stand, we sit, we stand, and we sit. But we're going to stand again for the reading of God's Word. Please stand as we turn to Matthew 28, 28, and verse 16. And I'll say the Word of the Lord when I'm done reading, and then together you will say, thanks be to God. Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The word of the Lord. Father, bless this word to our hearts. May we receive it, live by it, and do the will of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say it again. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last week I spoke to you on the subject of being strong in the Lord, to be strong in the Lord. And the main point of last Sunday's sermon, because it was the first Sunday of Pentecost, the season upon which the Holy Spirit descended on his church, we talked about that the only way that we can ultimately be strong in the Lord is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to follow up on that theme, the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit is so important when we consider all that's coming against us. The apostles, they received power on the day of Pentecost, and they were able to open up their mouths, and they spoke in other languages that they had not learned before or had not known before. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit to enable them to do such a great story and, as, and talk about a great thing that happened. So today, we want to talk about the backstory for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We want to talk about the backstory of this idea of being a witness for Jesus. And if you have your Bible... Turn with me in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 8, and it kind of gives us a real clear understanding of how we are to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. So there are four things I want to share with you, and the first thing is that we must obey the voice of God to be an effective Christ follower. We must obey the voice of God to be an effective Christ follower. Notice what it says in Matthew 28, 16. It says, then the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So they obeyed. Jesus had told them before his death that he would be crucified. Jesus had told them before his death that he would rise again. And so Jesus told them, after all this occurred, to go to a certain mountain in a certain place, and they all obeyed. Now we hear this great commission that's given to the disciples, and we conclude this commission as universal for the entire Christian church, and we are told to go. We are told to go and make disciples. So we have to learn how to practice this principle of obedience and walk in the blessings. So the question that all of us have to ask ourselves is, do we truly obey and trust God? An example of obedience by Jesus himself was that God sent Jesus to come down from heaven. And the Bible tells us that in creation process that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were present. It says the Holy Spirit was brooding over the waters. Jesus is the Word. He executed the creation of the earth with God the Father. So there, there, there was this keen relationship between Jesus and his Father, between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. There's this connectivity between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus demonstrates that connectivity because he continually prays to his Father during his earthly ministry. He continually is led by the Holy Spirit during his earth, earthly ministry. In Luke chapter 4, it says Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. So if Jesus, catch this, if Jesus could respond and connect and depend on his Father, if Jesus could connect and respond to the Holy Spirit, shouldn't we 
connect and respond to God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. Jesus was in close connection his whole ministry. We need to be in close connection. And one of the things that God tells us to do is to go, and we need to be obedient. Think about Jesus in his most critical hour. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it was a time when it would just be moments before he would be taken by the soldiers. It would be moments before they would arrest him, moments before they would actually physically beat him up, punch him in the face, punch him in the face, spit on him, do all manner of evil, cuss at him. And before his most greatest hour of need, he depended on his heavenly father. And in prayer, he was waiting before it would happen. He was in prayer with his 12 disciples, his 11 disciples, and he was waiting. And he asked them to pray for him. And in his most severe, deep moment of need, the most critical time in his three-year ministry, he said, Father, he cried out, if there's some way that I would not have to go through this torture, this pain, Father, make another way for me. And God is silent because he knows what the answer is. And then he says, not my will, but thy will be done. What a great act of obedience it was on Jesus' part. He obeyed his Father for you and I, and we ought to also have obedience. Another example that grips me on obedience is in Acts chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 9. There was this guy named Saul, and he was a real aggressive guy. He did not like Christians. As a matter of fact, he was, he was persecuting Christians. And in Acts chapter 9, Nine verse one. It says, "Meanwhile, Saul, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found there any who believed to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem." As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, "Saul." Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into this city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And then the story proceeds on, and a guy named Ananias had to go minister to Saul. And the Holy Spirit spoke to Ananias and said, there's this man called Saul. I want you to go and pray for him. And Ananias said, wait a minute. That's the guy who's trying to kill us. I can't go to be around him. He's trying to kill us. And God says, go, for I've told you to go, Ananias. So Ananias was obedient, and he went, and when he saw Saul in the condition that he was in, that he was blind, the Bible says that Ananias laid his hands on Saul, and immediately he could see. And Saul got up from his condition and went to start telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Saul was obedient. Ananias was obedient. After Saul got blind and got healed, he also was obedient. So we see from the very beginnings of our Christian faith that obedience is what carried the day. So the question for us this morning is, are we going to obey God in this great commission that God has given us today? When we obey God, it will cost us something, but we nonetheless have to be obedient. Point number two. Making disciples is a major part of being a Christ follower. Making disciples is a major part of being a Christ follower. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 28, and let's look at verse 20. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
Go and make disciples of all nations. This was something that was a part of the very beginning. It was a part of the DNA of the disciples. It was a part of the DNA of the Christian church. It says that in Acts, uh, the first few chapters, that they all gathered together and they listened to the apostles' teachings. They were obedient because they wanted to hear about this Jesus who had saved their souls. Remember when the day of Pentecost came, 3,000 people converted and got saved and got yes to Jesus. And so they were obedient in the call of coming to Jesus, and they were obedient in their follow-through in coming to church, reading the Bible, and in sharing Jesus with others. And so this great commission that we have it is tremendously important. It is something that's critical for the survival of the church, and it's critical for your own soul to be blessed. So as we think about the subject of being witnesses for Jesus Christ, it's one of the important, most important missions that we have. It's the prime mandate. We have to ask ourselves, truly ask ourselves, and this is a rhetorical question. Don't answer it out loud. Ask ourselves, are we truly being faithful and good witnesses for Jesus? Do we see opportunities in the store? Do we see opportunities with our family members? Do we see opportunities in the marketplace? And when we go on our daily routine to see opportunities to share the love of Christ with others, this is a church where we've tried to create an environment for us to share Jesus with other people. And over the next several Sundays, I'll be giving you some practical solutions and ideas and suggestions on how we can share our faith. The idea of sharing our faith to me as a young person when I first got saved, it was daunting. It was hard. It was something that I didn't know how I could do it. I didn't think I was as good of a speaker as some. And so we all tend to recoil about the idea of sharing Jesus with other people. Do you know the name of Jesus is a sensitive word in our culture? Do you notice that the name of Jesus is the name that people use when they're going to cuss? Do you know that the name of Jesus is the prayer that people don't want to be prayed in the name of Jesus? It's a sensitive name because the devil knows that there's power in the name of Jesus and that people can be saved. And so he's doing everything in his power to stop his church from being a witness for him. So we have to obey God. We have to realize that a major part of being a Christian is to share Jesus with others. And if you're not in that mindset, I want to just stir your mind to get in that mindset. And I want to give you some tools and give you some ideas and how you can be an effective Christ follower. Because once you do it, like the old adage says, try it, you will like it. Do you know that doctors, when they see babies that are born, I've been in hospitals and I've seen babies born out of my own personal relationship with my kids and other people that have invited me to go to hospitals. I think it's a quite of an honor that you're invited, even with the mother of the woman that's having a baby and the husband and, the, and all the family. And they asked me, a pastor, to be there too. And I've been in a couple of those situations where I've been in the room. And the doctor and those that are watching, it's the most exciting thing to see a little child born. Now, everyone's excited except the mother that's doing the child bear. <laughs> but it's exciting. And then once that child is born, even the mother, after she's gone through all those labor, sometimes moms have to go through 20 hours of labor, sometimes it's even longer than that, but after it's all done and the baby comes out, the mom's agony, tears, and frustration turn to joy because she sees that little baby and she's able to hold that little baby. And everybody is in the room getting excited. The first thing we want to do is start taking pictures. We're so excited because a little baby has been born. And then that precious little baby, after the few days goes by, people hold that baby in their arms and they're so excited. The joy that comes up across the human heart of the birth of a baby is unparalleled. And just like on that level, we all are excited. We all are so excited for the birth of a child. When you, on a spiritual level, see the spiritual birth of someone that comes to Jesus, it's the greatest joy that you could ever feel and experience as a Christian. It's the greatest happiness because you've seen someone who was in darkness that says yes to Jesus, and they're saved. It sounds good. It feels good. It's the right thing to do. We need to be Christ followers who share Jesus with other people. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Are you a Christ follower that shares Jesus with other people? Now, notice that in verse 20 where it says, go. Verse 19 where it says, go and make disciples 
of all nations. The gospel is just not reserved for white people. The gospel is just not reserved for black people. The gospel is just not reserved for Latino, for Asian, for Indian. The gospel is just not reserved for one group, but it's for all people. Everybody say all. all. Isn't that wonderful? So we have to be skilled in our presentation of the gospel to be able to share with a person of another race. A person of another race. Can you share the gospel with a person of another race? My, what a novel thought, Deborah. To share the gospel with someone of another race. That means you take the time to understand and to learn and to have compassion with people of all people groups, all religious perspectives, and we care enough about them that we want them to receive the gospel. We care about people that are homeless, we want them to receive the gospel. We care about people that are rich, we want them to receive the gospel. We care about Democrats, we want them to receive the gospel. We care about Republicans, we want them to receive the gospel. We care about independents, we want them to receive the gospel. And God has called you and I to go and tell somebody. Everybody say go. All right, so when we go, when we go, it's an action word. When we go, it's like a train coming up, getting steam. We got to go. And as I'm going up, I go out my day, I go out my house, and I run into Karen. And I didn't even know I was going to run into Karen because I was willing to go. When you get up in the morning, God is calling you to, as you go, to tell the world. Sometimes we think about the idea of people, and I used to be one of these Christians because I was bold. I would go knock on doors. When I was going to school, I'd talk to people hundreds at a time. I didn't care. I love talking to people. You know, even where I'm at now, I'm at a football game, and the subject comes up, I want to talk about the Lord. So sometimes you have to be intentional about going. But most of the time, for all of us in this room, is it is as you go on your daily routine, you will run into a Karen. You will run into a carol and a carol, and as you go, God will give you the words to say. So you know what I'm saying? Every day I get up in the morning, I go, okay, Lord, it's another day. I'm your available servant. I'm ready to go. You told me in Matthew 28 and 19 that I'm to go. Okay, Lord, I'm ready to go. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know how I'm going to say it. But as I go and run into a Karen on the street, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, shoot, should I? Do you want me to say something to Karen? And the Holy Spirit will say, yes. And then sometimes the Holy Spirit says, no, Bob. He sometimes says, wait. But you have to be listening to his voice. And he'll tell you what to say. He may tell you to start on an average situation, on an average conversation. How about Jesus when he met the woman at the well? He didn't start talking about spiritual things. He started talking about water. A very serious and easy thing that people needed, water. And from his conversation about water, he started talking about spiritual water. And the conversation went from there. So God will help you in your average, everyday conversations to move from the natural to the spiritual. And the natural to the spiritual means eventually you tell them about the Lord. We have several people in this room this morning that are in the education system. And I won't call out their names, but some of you are teachers, some of you are coaches, some of you are leaders in the school system. And you, because you are a leader and a teacher, kids look up to you. And kids sometimes are very persistent and nosy, and they want to know what you believe. And many of you that are teachers over the last several years, you've told me about stories about how people ask you about your faith, and because they asked you, you can tell them. And so you and I are just like those teachers. God has put us in positions of influence. Everyone say influence. So God at some time is going to allow you to be in a position where God's going to look at Jill, he's going to look at Deborah, and he's going to raise them up, elevate them, and people are going to come to them and ask them for advice. Deborah teaches a class at Mount Norman University, a music class. So students love to ask teachers questions. 
God has elevated her for such a time as this to be a witness for him, and God will give her those opportunities to be a witness. God will give you the opportunity. So you simply need to know how to tell the gospel message. You don't have to try and lead people to the Lord by convincing them with great words and great ideas. All you need to do when God gives you the ability and God gives you the green light to tell somebody about the Lord, you tell them the gospel message. Well, pastor, what is the gospel message? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. Verse 2, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I have preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So Paul, the Apostle Paul writes this letter, and he's making it clear on what the critical message that people need to share with other people, and that critical message is the gospel. People need the gospel. People are about to perish. How many, how many of you have ever seen that Liberty Insurance commercial where the guy's on this little rollerblade or whatever, and the lady's talking about Liberty, and he's on this rollerblade rolling by, and they're standing by a body of water, and he rolls up to the edge, and he on this new thing, and he flips over into the water, and right next to him, as he's in the water gapping for air, there's a lifesaver, and she says, oh, I better save <laughs> throw the lifesaver because he needs help right now. You and I have the gospel message, and people are in the water, metaphorically drowning, and you need to throw somebody the lifesaver of the gospel. Because if you and I don't do it, they're going to drown. They're going to perish. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For I receive, verse 3, what I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scripture, and that he appeared to Peter and to 500 people. So the gospel message is that Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he arose on the third day, and that he appeared to many people after his resurrection. That's all you need to tell. Pastor, is that as simple as it is? And then what you need to do is to make it personal. And then you need to share how Christ changed me. All of us have a personal story. Okay, this is a question that I want to ask for hands. All right, get ready. How many of you have received Jesus Christ as Savior? Raise your hand. Okay. So all of you have a personal testimony, and all of you have come to faith in Christ. And when you come to faith in Christ, you are a changed person. You're radically changed. You're excited about this new Christian walk. And you can share your story of how Jesus saved you. I was messed up. I had problems. And Jesus came into my heart, and I asked him to forgive me of my sin, and he did. And his precious Holy Spirit came into my heart, and it changed my life. You tell him your story, and then you tell him his story. That's the gospel, and that's all it is. Is that as simple as it is, Pastor? Yes. It's not hard. You can just tell it the way it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, those verses I just read to you, that sharing the gospel message. And the Bible is so radically clear about what you or I get ready to do when we share the gospel. For Paul says in verse chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power. Everybody say power. power. The gospel has power. And when you share that simple message, it changes lives. I asked how many of you earlier, how many of you received Christ as Savior? Many hands went up. It was the power of God that saved you. It wasn't the eloquence of the speaker. It was the gospel that saved you. And God is asking you to be a gospel sharer. Let the church say amen. amen. So we need to be obedient. We need to know that it's important. It's a major part of every Christian experience. And then number three, teaching people the words of Jesus will change lives. Teaching people the words of Jesus will change lives. Go back to Matthew 28 and verse 20. It says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
And so how do we learn the words of Jesus over time? Hang out in the Gospels. Hang out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and keep rehearsing. Keep reading the words of Jesus, and you'll find that there's a central theme. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> there's a central theme in the words of Jesus, and that central theme is love. Everybody say love. It was a hymn writer that wrote the, the hymn, Love Lifted Me. Love will change your life. Love will make you a distinct Christian. Love will make you stand out from the rest. Love will make you become and a part of a church that's vibrant, that's excited, that's happy, that's dancing. Last night we were dancing. It was a church that was alive. And I'm sure some of the people who were there thinking, well, how come the church is so alive and happy and dancing? What right do they have to be dancing in a church that's being so sacrilegious? No, it's not. The Bible says that Jesus Turn the water into wine. And do you know at weddings and in those cultures, they dance. So Jesus was endorsing dancing. The Bible says in uh, Psalms chapter 48 to praise God with the dance. So what we were doing, Brother Bob, was legal. It was official. It was okay because the Bible says it's okay to dance in Psalm 148. And the Bible says that David danced. And he had a good time dancing because he was excited about those. So never think that being in a Christian, you can't dance. Yes, you can. You can dance in this church. You can dance on the street. You can dance anywhere you want to go because you're a Christian who's been set free. And when you're set free, you're free indeed. And you want to dance. We, we danced to the Kurt Franklin song, Stomp. We were stomping. We were dancing. We had a good time. And when we left last night, Boy, we looked at each other, we go, ooh, we tired. <laughs> and then I got to thinking about that gospel song, I'm not tired yet. And I go, oh, yes, I am. I'm tired. <laughs> so dancing is a good thing. Dancing brings the heart merriment. And we, the church of Jesus Christ, need to lead the way in the dance. Now, the world, they got a dance that ain't sometimes too holy. You know what I'm talking about, those unholy dances. But we, the church of Jesus Christ, we have a holy dance because we've been sanctified. We have a holy dance because we've been filled with the Spirit. We have a holy dance because we've been set free from the sins of the past. And so we can be happy about it. We can laugh. We can have the joy of the Lord. Now, there's one more point I got to make, and then I'm going to let you go. Point number four, we must baptize people and teach people about God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. One of the members in our church, and that member's here this morning, was asking me about the Trinity. And I gave that member a bunch of scriptures about the Trinity. Now, Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible. The Trinity doctrine basically means that God expresses himself through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, Deuteronomy 6, our God is one, so he's one God, but he expresses himself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And since he is one God, he expresses himself in ways that we can identify with who he is. So if you want some scriptures on the Trinity, the doctrine of the fact that the Bible endorses God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, if you want to listen to this later on in the broadcast, or if you want to write these scriptures down, you can write them down. Matthew 28, 19, which we've been preaching on this morning. Hebrews 1, 3. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. 2 Corinthians 13, 13. 1 Peter 1, 2. Revelations 1, 4 to 6. Ephesians 4, 4. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 to 6, and on and on. I got so many scriptures that the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity, but God expresses himself, expresses himself clearly as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'll give you one scripture that I want us to turn to. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Second Corinthians 13, 11. And you see the apostles constantly, when they write their letters, they were referring to this idea of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. 
Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. And then here it is, verse 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. See how that works? The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And you see the gospel writers referring to God in this way many times. So remember I talked about early on, that's why I took some time in talking about the unity between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus related to his Father God. So when we share with us who our God is, he comes to us in personal, direct ways through God the Father, God the Son. We celebrated the Son, his death and his resurrection, his body, his blood, and we celebrate now we're in the season of Pentecost, which we are celebrating. Hallelujah. We are celebrating in the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is so exciting to celebrate the presence of the Holy Spirit. A church that does not respond to and acknowledge the power of the Holy Spirit is a dead church. Some churches say, oh, we don't believe in that Holy Spirit stuff. We don't believe in speaking in tongues. We don't believe in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me show you what the Holy Spirit does. It's the season of Pentecost. That's after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension up until the season of Advent. So the next five months is the season of Pentecost, which we're celebrating the power. Everybody say power. The power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost as a festival celebrates the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. As an extended season, it commemorates the continuing work of the triune God. Triune. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in creation, redemption, and sanctification of human beings, the church, and the world. The triune presence is made especially manifest in the work of the Holy Spirit calling, enlightening, gathering, guiding, and sanctifying the people of God on their earthly pilgrimage. So we need the Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. All right, stand to your feet. Now I'm going to ask everybody to repeat a prayer, and it's a prayer of faith. You're going you're gonna to be taking a risk. But I believe you're going to be blessed, and I believe this prayer that I'm going to ask you to pray is a prayer that's God-ordained. It's God-ordained. It's something that we as a church need to pray. It's something that we as a church need to do. It's something that we as a church need to adhere to. So I'm asking you to pray. Every eye closed. Every head bowed. This is a holy moment. We need to pray this prayer. Somebody needs Jesus today. We need to pray this prayer. If you're at a place right now where you sense that this gospel message does not apply to you, and you sense that you need Jesus in your heart, just raise your hand. Me and the elders are the only ones looking. Just say, Pastor, I need to pray that prayer and receive Christ. Is there one? Is there two who would say, you know, I'm not saved. I need the Lord. Is there one? Is there two? I need Jesus into my heart. I want to lead you in a prayer of salvation. Yes, I see that hand. Just receive and say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I believe that you died on the cross for me. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And now I'm going to ask those of us that are Christians, I'm going to ask us to hold our hands up to heaven. And only if you want to say this prayer. It's a risky prayer, but I believe it's an essential prayer that every Christian needs to be praying on a regular basis. Repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, lead me to be a witness for you each day. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, now you can look at me. You are now empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness. Don't be afraid because the enemy is going to make you try to be fearful. But remember, greater is he that is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. So you got power. Everybody say power. power. So you got the power to tell somebody. 
So go tell somebody this week. Go fishing this week. See how God will work through you. And it's not going to be your words. You're going to be amazed when it's all done. You're going to go, wow, I can't believe I said that, Chuck. Because the Holy Spirit in you is going to tell you what to say. And you're going to go under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Remember, I said sometimes the Holy Spirit will tell you to speak. And sometimes he'll say, keep your peace and be silent. So you wait for that moment. And when the moment comes, say to the person, this is what has happened to me. Remember, spiritually, they're in the water drowning. If you can get that picture in your mind, then you'll realize, no, I got to help this brother or sister. They're drowning spiritually. They're going to die eventually spiritually. So I got to give them the answer. I got to throw them the lifeline, which is Jesus and the gospel. Amen? Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a hand clap. He's doing a good thing. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. All right, two things. We had this big, big, wonderful kickoff uh, yesterday. Deborah, would you say a few words about the kickoff? And also, before she speaks, does everybody have a slip that we passed out last night? Did we pass that out when we came in this morning? Someone, is that a yes or no? My leaders, the little slip, pledge slip? Okay, let's get those. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you weren't here uh, before Deborah speaks. Raise your hand if you weren't here, and we're going to pass out one of these slips to you. Deborah's giving you the why. She's going to give you the why of why you need to fill out that slip. And then I want you to fill it out in faith. And it's going to be a stretch because you have six months to deliver on what God wants to bless you to do. He wants to bless you to bless this house because we're making this house even better so we can be a witness for Jesus. Amen? So when they come in and see our bathrooms, they're going to say, ooh, this is a church to keep their bathrooms clean. How about when you go into a hotel room, what's the first thing you look at? At least for me, I got to see if I got a clean bathroom or not. So God wants us to have clean bathrooms so we can be a witness for Jesus Christ. Okay, Deborah, give us the why. If you, if you have your Bible, or if you don't, I'm in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is the salt if it has lost its savor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled under for its worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. I, I feel like the Lord... Excuse me, Deborah, as you're talking. Everybody raise your hand if you need a slip. If you weren't here, Alvin's passing them out. Keep them raised until you get a slip. Latasha's coming. We want everybody to have a slip. And as Deborah's talking, you can just start filling it out. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. I want you to stretch and allow God to use you to be a blessing for his kingdom. I'm sorry, Deborah. Go. I feel like, <laughs> I think for some of us, raising money for a bathroom is honestly tedious. Yeah, but that's not why we're doing this fundraiser. Matthew 5 says we're a city on a hill. We're a light. And think about where this church is on the corner of Highway 99 and Nave Street, there is this building. And I, I believe in my mind's eye, the Lord showed me a vision of this church being open so often that it's like um, when I was a teenager, we used to do these, um, what do we call them? You know those big round lights that shoot up in the sky? The big spotlights? In Seattle, they would, someone would rent the spotlight and put it somewhere in the city. And then we would have to try to find it. We would follow the light and find it. And whoever got there first got a prize. So sometimes on Friday nights, we'd go out looking for the light. Yeah? And I feel like in my mind's eye, the Lord showed me. In fact, I almost asked Pastor if we could rent one of those lights. Because I think that this spot right here, this church being here, is spiritually strategic. It's a place where people will know that's where Jesus is. That's where light is. Go to the light. Go to the light. Now, I know this. Pastor talked about babies earlier, right? Yeah, and, and, and we, when a new 
person comes to know Jesus are excited for the baby. Think about it. When that baby poops on you, you ain't upset. When they spit up on you, you ain't upset. That baby could be ugly. You still think that baby's cute. <laughs> when a new person comes to the Lord, that's how the angels feel. That's how we feel. We're so happy. Don't care if you spit up on us or throw at us or nothing. But you do not want to go into the bathroom to change that diaper and have it be stinky and dirty and nasty. So it's not like the building doesn't matter. It does. But that's not why we're trying to raise money. If you've ever been a little bit low on groceries and you came here to the food pantry and there was food there, you're thankful that this place is here. If you have children and you watched how they run to Miss Janet and they're so excited to have her teach them, you know why this church is here. If you've come to a service and there was a song that the worship team led in that blessed you, then you know why this church is here. If you've ever been sick and pastors come straight up to that hospital and visited you and prayed with you or Alvin and LaChasha prayed with you, you know why this church is here. And we want to take care of the building that God has given us so that we can continue to do great things. So number one, we're a light. And here's the other reason. If you look around this room, I, I hate to point it out, but most of us are old. I'm just saying, I'm old. And I want to leave a legacy for the people behind me. And I want to leave a spiritual legacy. I want them to say, when I'm dead, she pointed me to Jesus. And I want them to know that I didn't leave them a building that's a fixer-upper. I left them a good heritage so that they can continue the ministry that God has called us as this lighthouse on the hill to do. Amen? When you fill out that card, a number's going to come in your head and you're going to go, Lord, I don't know how that's going to happen. That's okay. He's stretching you. And if you will commit to writing that number down, he will provide opportunities for him to fulfill that promise you made. I've done it dozens of times, and I'm always amazed. He did it. But when I was filling out the card, I was like, oh, Lord. I had a number in my head a few weeks ago that I felt the Lord dropped in my spirit. And one of our refrigerators broke last week right as we had just finished off paying for the other refrigerator that broke last year. And I'm thinking, I probably should change that number. And the Holy Spirit said, no, let me help you achieve what I've dropped in your spirit. That's not just about money, y'all. That's about all the life stuff. Holy Spirit, help me achieve what you've dropped in my spirit. Amen? Can we stand together? Can you just hold up that piece of paper if you have it in your hand? And let me pray with you. Father God, I ask, you're stretching us. Thank you. Your word said that we would do greater things than even your son did when he was here on earth. So I know you got some great power, some great plans for your people. And I ask God now that as we step into those, as we commit to listen to your voice and do what you say, that God, I know you will be there. You will help us. You will provide. And I will have a testimony. We will have a testimony that yes, my God is good. Yes, my God is faithful. And he can do it. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you. If this is your first time, I welcome you. I hope that some of the testimonies you heard from our new members this morning warmed your heart. It always makes me feel good to know that somebody thinks we're friendly and that we're welcoming and that we can love on them. So I appreciate hearing that. Thank you. 
Um, this is home. Even if it's your first time, this is home because Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is here. You are home. Come back next week. Come back on Tuesday night for Bible study. Come back on Sunday morning for Bible study. We're just a one big family, and we need to know each other and love each other and be a big family. Sandra wants to come and thank everybody. We had a fun last night. We had some food. We had some dancing. We had um, the jazz band. It was just a good time. Family got together, and we had a reunion. We really did. Good morning, everybody. I just want to say, oh, my goodness, we had so much fun last night. But I really, really, really would like to thank the subcommittee for... Um, being who you are. You, can, you guys showed up and you showed out. So Carol, thank you. Ben, thank you. Scott and Dee Dee, thank you. Karen, thank you for the dinner, the meal, the time, the preparation. Deborah, thank you for the music. Greg, thank you for the band. Um, they were awesome. Everything turned out really, really nice. Linda and the Jones family, Thank you, because you guys showed up and, and did what you did, and you just helped me so much. This is a collective effort, and everybody did their part. Thank you so much. And that's what family's about. Um, we have a couple of other announcements. Vacation Bible School is on the 17th through the 21st. It's in the evening. If you would like to sign up to help, the more people that sign up, the more fun it can be for the kids. There is a table in the foyer where you can sign. They, um, they have different positions for people to work on. Um, we Brother Up and Sister Up is this Saturday, 610. Brother Up is at 8 in the morning. Sister Up is at 1030. Come and meet some more brothers and sisters. The brothers really go all out for breakfast. I'm not sure if they are this week or not, but they cook a full yes. Alvin says yes. Come have a good breakfast with them all. They do a Bible study, and they have a really good time. We're looking for someone to coordinate Tuesday night dinners. Now, that doesn't mean you do the cooking. It doesn't mean that you do all of it. It means you coordinate it. It means you ask a brother or sister to come and cook. And um, coordinating can be more fun than doing sometimes. If doing is not your gift, coordinating can be your gift. We do need help for Tuesday night coordinating. Covenant Women's Retreat is September 20 through to 24. Registration is open. It opened July 1st. There are scholarships available. Please see Latasha. She's in the back. She's also our women's ministry <clears throat> leader. Um, giving. Push Pay is still available. There's a lovely little box in the back with a big sign on it that says offering. You're welcome to drop your offering in there as well. And we thank you for every single way that you support this church family. Please stand for the benediction. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Karen. I'd just like to echo everything Karen and Sandra said. Love was abounding last night. I'll tell you, it was absolutely fantastic. And thank you for all the people that made it possible for the rest of us to have such a good time. It was great. Deborah, you were really going strong there for a minute. That was really fantastic until you talked about old. <laughs> I don't, there's a commercial on TV where this woman talks about age being just a number. And she said, mine's unlisted. <laughs> so, so we have to remember that because we're all going to get to that number someday. But anyway... Love is abounding, and that's important. And from what Pastor was saying about going and preaching the gospel, you have to do it in love. So hear these words from the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonians. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. So it's a beautiful day out there. 
Go out and tell somebody about the love of Christ. Bring your bait and go fishing. Thank you. Have a great day.